nameless Prince of Peace, bruised in battle, scarred and scorned, sacred him pierced by our thorns. His finish was his cry, the perfect Lamb was crucified, his sacrifice.
Please, and open to the book of Luke, Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 23, if you would, this morning. Luke chapter 23. We're going to be looking at just a few verses here. Luke chapter 23, verses 33 through 43. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, the malefactors, one on one right hand, and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them uh, derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, uh, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews... Save thyself. And a superscription was also written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the male factors which hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Does not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, For we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Simple, three simple truths we want to discover and take a look at today. I'd like to draw your attention to the place of His grace. The place of His grace. Notice what it said there in verse number 33, if you were following along with me. And they came uh, there where they come to the place. I want you to notice that this place, first of all, was a prepared place. This was a prepared a place. And by the way, it was prepared by Jesus Himself. How many of you agree with that? First of all, it was prepared by Jesus himself because he made it. Can I get an amen? It was prepared by Jesus because he created it. 
It was prepared by Jesus because he grew the tree that they were hanging him on. You see, so it was a prepared place even before the foundation of the world in the heart and mind of God. God had already prepared this place for this time. And you said, wait a minute, you just said Jesus prepared it. Now you said God prepared it. Well, you got that right because it's the same one. Jesus is God. God is Jesus. All together, they're the same one. Amen? Amen. So even before Jesus in his incarnation, God had already prepared this place. And so it wasn't anything unusual. It wasn't anything strange or something that was to all of a sudden happen and, and pop up on the scene. Oh, no, in the heart and mind of God, this was already been prepared. And Jesus was prepared and ready for it. When we talk about it, it was a prepared place. It was called the place of Calvary, is what it says in the scriptures there. And the definition of Calvary is also called Golgotha, in the Hebrew meaning the place of the skull. And even to this very day, it looks like a skull. And so thus the calling of it there. So it was a prepared place. And the reason why Genesis 1-1 tells us that in the beginning, God created Can we say that together? In the beginning, God created. Are you with me on this? Amen. He created the heaven and the earth. So Calvary was already a prepared place. So we thank the Lord for that. And then I want you to notice not only was it a prepared place, but it was a painful place. It was a very painful, excruciating, torture, execution place. Matter of fact, I want you to notice, first of all, it was real pain, ladies and gentlemen. Don't take the cross and the crucifixion lightly. It wasn't just some things that happened. It wasn't no big deal. I mean, after all, you know, that's all they do it all the time. Rome had become professionals in execution. They'd even got it to where it became a, a spectacle, and spectators came out to watch it just like they did in the Colosseums to, to watch the electricians being fed to the lions. They had gotten so good at it. And yet today, how often do we take it so lightly? Okay, no big deal, Jesus crucified. Okay, let's move on. I'd like to see you go through it. We'd better not forget what it costs for our salvation. It wasn't cheap. It wasn't free. It cost God everything. Yes, you get it for free, hallelujah. But oh, it cost God his precious son. And it was a very painful place. We could go back and we're not going to look at it today and go through all the aspects of the crucifixion from start to finish and what it all in details and engulfs because we've done that before. But I just want you to recall just a little bit of where it all started in the Garden of Eden and praying that night, Father, uh, if it be, let this cup pass for me. That cup was your cup. It was my cup. It was the cup of the sins of the world that God was pouring out on his son that evening and he knew he was going to go through that and he was asking the Lord. Lord, if it be thy will, let it pass. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And he began to bleed right there, my friend. I want to tell you, the Bible says his sweat became as drops of blood. And there's where the blood began to shed. Without the shedding of the blood, church, there is no remission of sin. Thank God for the blood. We still sing about the blood in this church. It's still the blood is in our hymnals. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. There's power and cleansing power in the blood. I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Yeah, we got a bloody gospel. Hallelujah. Thank God for the blood. The blood was not just any regular blood. Even though he was man, yes, 100% man, but what flowed in his veins was blood from heaven's throne and from Emmanuel's throne, from glory, you see. Why? Because he was conceived not of Joseph, not of a human man. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit of God. Therefore, his blood was precious blood. It was spotless blood. It was sinless blood. Folks, there's nobody else on the planet that can claim that other than Jesus Christ. Oh, it was a painful place. It started there. Then at midnight, the arrest and all the beating that he took in the six mocked up phony trials, three Jewish trials done at night in secret, totally against their own laws. Three Roman trials, totally against all of that. And then there was the beating from the soldiers and the punching in his face and the plucking of the beer out of his face and the spitting in his face and the mocking and planting the thorns in his crown and then the whipping of a cat and nine tails and on and on and then the walk down the Via Dolorosa that she just sang about 
about and on that path and falling and stumbling all the way down until Cyrena had to tear the cross for him the rest of the way. Then he got to Golgotha and then they threw him down on the ground, threw his back out over onto that tree. Then they took those nails and those spikes, which are right up here. There's one of them made. That spike right there was made by a person in Alaska for me and that whip, he took it and digested it and researched it out and that's approximately what they went through, six to nine inches in length and they drove that through the media in the wrist right through the media nerve here and there they nailed the son of God to the cross the pain and the anguish of the cross you see oh and then they nailed his feet to the cross and oh there and they dropped him down in a hole and that thud and thud and then having to push his bloody beaten back up a tree in order to breathe and exhale air I'm telling you it was a painful place don't ever take it for granted there was debate this week on the radio I was listening to one of the Christian calling stations, and they were debating whether or not they should uh, go through all of that with the kids in the teaching, whether they should speak of that and bring that out. Yes, I say. They need to know what Jesus went through. Hey, if they can watch these ungodly videos and all the television with all of its blood and guts and then glorify it, then surely we can tell them what Jesus went through on the cross of Calvary that paid for their salvation. I'm telling you, it was a prepared place, all right? It was a painful place. It was real pain. But why? There had to be a purpose for that real pain. You know what that purpose was? Redemptive pain. Redemptive pain. There was a purpose for this place, and it was called redemption Two of my favorite verses in the Bible in Romans chapter 3. Follow along in your notes there. Being justified. Being what? Say it with me. Being what? justified being what just as if you had never sinned being that you stand righteous before God how is it that you have never sinned how is it that you stand righteous before God it was by his grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus my friend whom God has set forth to be the propitiation big name there huh substitute or literally means covering I'm telling you everybody needs a covering Everybody needs their sins covered today, my friend. Through the faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Oh, we took our sins and we drove them like nails through His hands and feet. We lifted Him high on the cross for our transgressions and then we pierced His heart through with the spear of unbelief. Oh, my friend, I want to tell you, it was a prepared place. It was a redemptive pain. Oh, the redemption that was paid for your salvation. Need to take this serious, folks. If we'll start taking it a little more serious, we might start living a little different. We might start living a little better. We might start realizing the price that was paid for us and, and, and change some of our thinking and our attitude of what Jesus went through. You see, we get saved when we're kids or younger, and for time goes by and on and on, and pretty soon it becomes common. It becomes, well, hey, you know, I got saved, and okay, great, it's over with, we're good to go. Let's move on. No, my friend, that's why Jesus established the Lord's Supper. He said, I want you to remember what I went through. I don't want you to forget it. I want you to remember my death till I come again. Now, he may come right after this service, I hope. Wait till after the service, Amen. Because we want to give a chance for people to get saved. We want to get it out on the television. You see, we'll get it out there and let the, let the tribulation folks have to listen to it for seven years. Maybe somebody gets saved. Amen? Praise God. It was redemptive pain. All right, now let's take a look at the folks standing by. The Bible said there were plenty standing by. The people who saw His grace. We're going to look at the people who saw His grace. Now, the Scripture picks us up there for us about the, the three groups. But I'm, certainly, there was another group. It's not here in this particular passage. But no doubt Mary was there. Martha was there. The other Mary was there. Jesus' mother was there. There were some of the disciples there. I mean, there were others that saw it. And it's not recorded in Luke here that we're reading right here in this passage. But I want you to know something. The Bible does say there were some folks standing around. Everybody with me? Say Amen. Let's take a look at the people who saw his grace. Notice it says there, uh, there with me, and there in the verse it says, They crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the other side, one on the right hand. And the Bible says there, that it goes on, and the Jesus talked to him, parted his raiment. And verse 35, And the people stood beholding. 
the people stood beholding. You know, and it's interesting, that phrase, stood beholding. If you take some time a little bit to look that up, that phrase that stood beholding means to be a spectator. It means to view attentively. See, Rome had got so good at this, it actually became a spectation and a spectacle to come out and watch it like going to a sports arena or something. So the people were standing by as spectators watching the Son of God die. Just stood around. And then he begins to list some of them. Matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 39. And they that passed by railed on him, reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Aren't you glad this morning Jesus didn't come down from the cross? Had he come down from the cross, you'd have no salvation. There would have been no victory over sin, hell, death, and the grave had Jesus had come down off the cross. And the question is, could he? Absolutely. He could have come down off the cross with no problem. The Bible says in one place he could have called 12 legions of angels. Uh, six, uh, 12 legions of angels. That's 72,000 angels to come and set him free and to destroy the world, my friend. He wouldn't even need 72,000. He called on Michael and he could take care of it. I know in the Old Testament, one angel came down and destroyed the whole Syrian army that was surrounding Israel and Jerusalem them against the Hebrew people. One angel. Don't mess with God. He's got some heavy artillery. Amen. Amen. Thank God he didn't come down from the cross. Praise the Lord. Glad he didn't take that challenge. He didn't have to prove anything. He didn't have to prove who he was. He knew who he was. And why come down? Because in three days later, he's going to do a greater miracle. You see, it wouldn't have been a miracle for Jesus to come off. It would have been a miracle for Jesus to reach over or just to think it. And the nails would have popped right out. He would have, he'd, poof, they popped out, jumped down on the ground and said, You want me to come down? Well, I'm down. What you going to do about it? Amen? I bet they'd be running for their lives. But he wasn't there to a circus act. He had a purpose and a plan. Thank God he didn't come down. Praise the Lord, he didn't accept their challenge. But let's take a look at three of the groups that the scripture does mention. In verse 35, the Bible said there were rulers. There were rulers that were watching. This is the religious crowd, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the scribes, the high priest, and all that, and, the, and, and that whole clan was there, and Caiaphas, and all of them were there, and, and, and they derided him. The word deride there means to sneer or to scoff at. It means to turn up their nose. Never been around those people that walk by and their nose is so high they can't see. Amen. They got their nose lifted higher than their eyes. Or they like to come over and look down the ski slope at you. But the rulers, oh, and Matthew's gospel account says he trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. If he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. God didn't have to have him, he already had him. Hey. Amen. The rulers, oh, the religious crowd. And I want to tell you something. We got that same group today. We got the rulers today in our government and all over the place that look down on Christ. They, uh, they deride him and, and, they, and, and they make fun of him and they beguile him and, and, and all this. And this comes from a lot of them. And today they're telling us, oh, you can speak in Allah's name. You can speak in Confucius' name and the Dalai Lama and the Pope and all of this stuff. And you can pray in their name and you can talk in their name. And I believe this week or something, the Pope now has become infallible and that he overrides the word of God. Hogwash! The Pope is just a man. The Pope is a sinner. Come on, church, talk to me. Somebody's got to tell the people that are watching the truth. The Pope is a sinner just like you and I. The cardinals are sinners. The priests are sinners. The rabbis are sinners. The preachers are sinners. The evangelists, the prophets, everybody is a sinner. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. We've all gone out of our way and become unprofitable servants. I'm telling you, nothing overrides the word of God. And we're not to worship a pope. We're not to worship a statue. We're not to worship Mary. We're not to pray to them. There's only one mediator between God and man. And that is the man, Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, but there were the rulers. 
telling us we can't pray in Jesus' name, we can't speak in Jesus' name, but we can teach every other false religion in doctrine. We can speak in every other false religious, religious leader in the public schools and in our courthouses and in our government, but don't mention Jesus' name. Well, the soldiers, they were mockers. The mocking of the soldiers. Isaiah gives us a description of it a little bit. There was the mocking of the soldiers. We read it there in verse 36, if you want. And the soldiers also mocked him. He is despised and rejected of men, Isaiah tells us. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as if our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Will somebody tell me what that passage is talking about? Anybody got an idea what that passage was talking about? What was Isaiah just describing? He was describing the crucifixion. He was describing what Jesus was going through for us on the cross, my friend. And when it says, by his stripes, we are healed, he wasn't talking about physical healing. He wasn't talking about having your migraine healed. He wasn't talking about having your ulcers healed. No, my friend, he was talking about having your spiritual soul healed from the sin and the penalty of death, which is sin. Doesn't do a man or a woman good if they get physically healed and die lost without Christ. All of that, he didn't go through all what he went through on the cross and all of that so that I could have back healing. So I could get my knees healed. So as we learned in Sunday school, Uncle Andrews, whatever, uh, hang toenail. Oh, God, heal Uncle Andrews' toenail and deliver him from his hangnail because by through all, by your stripes, Jesus, we have been healed. Quit misquoting Scripture. Quit taking scripture out of its context. Jesus didn't go all of that so that we could have physical healing, my friend. Who needs physical healing? You need spiritual healing, my friend. And then one day when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory, you'll get your physical healing. We'll get brand new bodies. There won't be no more aches and pains. There'll be no more sorrow. No more crying, David. No more death. Oh, everything Jesus says, I'm going to make all things new. Hallelujah. Now, does God still heal today? Let me just clarify for those of you watching. Yes. We don't take away and under mess with the power of God and what God can do. And it's okay to pray for healing. And if God chooses to by his sovereign will, then he will. And if he does, praise God, give God the glory. But guess what? If he doesn't, then praise God and give God the glory. Amen? Amen. Start focusing on heaven. We're worried about what your problems are. Get focused on glory. Get focused on heaven. That's where we're going. This is not my home. This is not my world. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Hallelujah. We're going to have aches and pains. We're going to have problems. We're going to have tribulations. We're going to have all kinds of sorrow and heartache. But I'm telling you, there's a day coming when it'll all be gone. It'll all be erased when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory. Why? Because of the cross, the grace of his cross. All right, then there was the message. Look at the message in verse 38. In verse 38, we find the message. And the superscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek. Now, that's interesting. Why in the letters of Greek? Because that was on the account of the Hellenistic Jews that were there in Jerusalem that day. Because of the Passover. It was written in Latin because that was the language of the government under which he was crucified. And it was written in Hebrew because it was the language of the place with this deed of darkness was committed. But oh, look at the message. What was the message? Real simple. The king of the Jews. Folks, he was the king of the Jews then. He's the king of the Jews now. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. Oh, my friend, he is the coming king. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, there was another group standing there, thieves. The Bible calls them in this passage malefactors. You read the other passages, Matthew, for instance, Matthew 27, 38 says this, and, and then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Now, the word malefactors used here in Luke stands for evildoers. Uh, it employed, they were employed to do wicked things. 
Notice with me, the first thief is a blasphemer. The Bible says that he railed on Jesus. That is to speak evil of, to revile him. Can you imagine here he's on his last hours of his breath and he has an opportunity to get saved? He has an opportunity to repent of his sin and come to faith in Christ. And yet here he is blaspheming the Son of God. No doubt by this time he heard Jesus right off the bat of the, one of the seven sayings on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. No doubt through time and throughout Jerusalem and Bethany and Galilee and all the places over the past three and a half years, probably why this guy was committing some of his drastic deeds and evil deeds, may have heard of this Messiah, may have heard of this Christ, we don't know, but here he was, he's over here, and all he's just simply railing on the Son of God. He's looking back at Jesus over there, and he's blaspheming him, and he's railing on him, and speaking evil against him uh, in a conversation with the other thief over there, and he was doing in the beginning in some of the other gospel accounts. But in Luke's account, something happened, church. Something happened. I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't know what turned on, what clicked on. But I know it had to be the Spirit of God. Because he could not confess with his mouth that he was the Lord apart from the Holy Spirit of God. And this thief over here got some sense into him for somehow, some way. And he realized and he began to tell this man over here on this cross, listen buddy, we deserve what we get. We're evil. We're wicked. We deserve this crime. But this man has done absolutely nothing. Nothing. And then... The Bible says he turned to Jesus. Turn is another word for repentance. Yellow. And he confessed with his mouth, Lord, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And I'm telling you, this man believed that Jesus was going to rise from the dead because he said, Lord, will you remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom? And Jesus said, today. You see, that's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. And Jesus looked at him and said, Sir, today you shall be now, present tense, you shall be with with me in paradise. Woo! Glory to God. Man, I tell you what, oh, there was the blasphemer. He's over here. Friend, I want to tell you if you're a blasphemer today and you're doubting God and you're blaspheming Christianity and the Lord of God and the faith of God and the grace of God and the Word of God, I'm telling you, you need to get on the other cross. You need to have a transfer. You need to have a transpose. You need to get over and get transferred and get over to this cross over here where you can say to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest in to thy kingdom. Oh, praise God. Oh, the thieves were there. They were. So we have a blasphemer on one cross. We have a believer on another cross. We had a believer. I gave you three little facts here about a believer, this bro brother here. In verses 40 through 42, if you'll read them, you'll see what I'm talking about. I want you to know, first of all, I believe a believer loves Jesus. Can I get some amens or hallelujahs? On? I believe a believer loves Jesus. I believe somewhere in this, all that went on that day, somewhere in that time period, this man realized that Jesus loved him and he loved Jesus. You know why? Because the Bible says we loved him because he first loved us. And he knew that Jesus loved him on the cross. So a true believer is one who loves Jesus. I believe a true believer is one who repents. One who repents. Isn't that what he did? He turned. He was talking to this thief and he turned to Jesus. He repented. That's repentance when we turn. He said, listen, man, I know what I've done. I deserve what I've done. I am a sinner. I, get, I deserve this punishment. But, oh, God, I'm turning to you, Lord, in repentance and in love to you. And by faith, a true believer is one who has faith. A true believer is one who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, today, sir, will you remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom? And Jesus said, oh, hallelujah, today you shall be with me in paradise. Someone says, where's heaven? Wherever Jesus is. By the way, paradise and heaven are synonymous with each other. They're used in both, referring to the same place in both the Old and New Testament. Many times, often. So I don't have to worry. Somebody asked me, they'll say, well, where's paradise? I said, well, that's where Jesus is. Well, where's Jesus? I said, he's in heaven. Well, you just said, well, it's paradise. I said, no, it's heaven too, because that's where he's at. 
To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And just a few hours from now, when that thief died and bowed his head and died, he was going to be in paradise with the Lord. His body was going to be present with the Lord. Boy, I tell you what, Miss Eden, I can guarantee you, that old boy said, whoa, man, am I glad I made that decision. I never knew it would be like this. Here I was facing death, crucifixion, few hours left to breathe, and I was going to be dead, and then they're going to leave me to hang up there and let the vultures come and pick out my eyeballs and eat them and eat my flesh. That's what they did a lot of times. They let them hung up there until the wild animals and the birds nearly picked them clean. You see, oh, it was a torturous thing. And he was thinking about all of that, and he goes, whoa, man, what an exchange. I exchanged death and hell and the penalty of it and the suffering of it for glory. Woo! Praise God. Truly, truly, there's no question in my mind. He was the Son of God. Now let's look at the pardon offered by His grace. The pardon offered by His grace. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. How many of you have been forgiven today? How many of you have asked God to forgive you today? How many of you have experienced God's forgiveness today? You see, the, see, the cross was a pardon of, of offered by His grace. His grace offered to you and I today pardon from all of our sin, all of our guilt, all of our shame that he took upon him that day on Calvary. We have complete pardon. The Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And if you have the truth, you shall be free indeed. And Jesus said, I am the truth. Hallelujah. Oh, thank God for the pardon of sin. Jesus put it this way, whether it is easy to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed and walk. By the way, the only person listening to me, those of you watching my television right now, listening on the radio, the internet, iPhones, iPads, tablets around the world, there is only one person, listen to me, one person who can forgive you of sin. There's only one person who can pardon you of sin, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, period. There's no man can forgive you. There's no preacher can forgive you. I don't care if he's a pre-trib, pre-millennial, 1611 King James, Bible-thumping, uh, uh, Bible-kissing preacher. You understand? I'm lost for words when I get excited. He cannot forgive you of sin. I cannot forgive you of sin. Uh, Alan can't forgive you of sin. You understand that? No preacher can, no pastor, no rabbi, no monk, no Buddhist, no Dalai Lama, no pope. Quit going to the Pope for forgiveness of sin. Quit going to the priest for forgiveness of sin. Quit going to the cardinals and the bishops for forgiveness of sin. They cannot, they cannot forgive you of your sin. Only Jesus Christ can forgive you of your sin. And I don't say that in disrespect to the, our Catholic folks and our Catholic friends. I don't say that in disrespect to the Lutherans or Presbyterians, the Methodists or anybody else. I don't say that in disrespect to even the Baptists. There's only one person that can forgive you of your sin, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can pardon you and click because he's the only one that died for you. He's the only one that shed his blood for you. And without the shedding of that blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And therefore, no pope, no bishop, no pastor, no preacher, no evangelist, none of us have ever died and shed our blood for your sin. Only Jesus Christ did that. So let's start giving the praise and the glory to who gets it and deserves it. Praise the Lord. So oh, I have a complete pardon for sin. Jesus answered and said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Here it is. Here it is for all my friends on television watching. No man, no woman, no boy, no girl, no young person, no teenager, no old folks. It doesn't matter who you are. No one comes unto the Father except by me. Folks, you're not going to get to heaven. You're not going to get your sins apart, apart from Jesus Christ. Period. But not only was it a place to pardon offered by grace, but I want you to know there was a place offered for the saved. Say, that's me too. How many of you are saved today? How many of you, what did Jesus tell him? You want to see? The man got saved, didn't he? The thief got saved, and Jesus said, i got a place for you. And he said, it's a place called paradise. It's a place called heaven. Put that down, one and two. Paradise, heaven, both the same. I already covered that a while ago. Amen? How many are you saved today? How many are you saved today? Then you have experienced the pardon offered by his grace. You have been pardoned from all of your sin, and God has a place specially just for you, and it's called heaven. Heaven. Let me make it sure. It's not called purgatory. It's called heaven. That's a false doctrine and false teaching. 
There's no such thing as purgatory. You're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. Simple as that, my friend. I love you in Jesus' name. But i got to tell you the truth. You're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. If you're going to go to heaven, you got to get saved and born again and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin. Turn from your sin. Come in faith and trust Christ and His cross and what He's done for you. If you don't do that, you got nothing but hell to look forward to. And that's where this thief went that day on the cross. When he died, the Bible makes it clear he split hell wide open. Because we have the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And the Bible said they both died and one of them was carried off into Abraham's bosom and the other one says instantly, immediately he lifted up his eyes in hell and tormented in the flames and by the way that man is still there today and I can tell you what he's saying right now tell it to him preacher I told them back then, I said, I got five brothers. Go tell my five brothers so they don't come to this place. And they said, oh, they wouldn't believe if we sent some back even from the dead. No, my friend, but you got a chance to believe today. You got a chance to come to Christ today and trust him today and escape the flames and the torture of hell itself. People don't want to hear about hell, but that's where people are going. You see, this thief's idea was, oh, I'm going to have a good time in hell. I'm going to be down there with all my buddies and friends, and we're going to have a party, and we're going to pop a few Budweiser's and so forth. No, my friend, you will not. There will be no party in hell. There will be no popping tops of Budweiser in hell. You will be tormented in the flames of eternal hell for all eternity if you don't come to Christ. Oh, the place for the saved. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, also believe in me. Why? Because in my Father's house are many mansions. Additional dwelling places is what that means. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare. Remember, I told you it's a prepared place. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. John 14, 1 through 3. And I believe that's a good reference to the rapture of the church. There's a great difference. Listen to me between realizing on the cross he was crucified and on the cross he was crucified for me. For me and for you. That's why the apostle writes in Acts chapter 4, neither is there salvation in any other or there is none other name under heaven. What is it, church? There is none other name. Well, listen to me. Let's say it again. There is what? None other name. You want to get a little tongue trial? There's no other name. We got to understand that. There is no other name given under heaven whereby men or we must be saved. That's Bible. That's scripture. That, my friend, is the truth. But God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you and for me. The grace of his cross. Have you experienced it today? Do you know it? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Those of you that are watching by television with us right now, you've never been saved, you've never been born again, you've never made that commitment to come to Christ and trust Christ. And Some of you are turning it off. and I don't want to listen to that guy no more. Oh, he's offended me. Friend, my intention was not to intend you. My intention was to tell you the truth. I'm telling you, you got to come to Christ. Repent of your sin, turn from your sin, and turn to Jesus. And believe on Him with faith, trusting Him. On His finished work on the cross of Calvary, heaven will be your home. There'll be that pardon of sin if you're willing to come to Christ today. We're going to pray here in the auditorium, and we're going to pray with you there on television that are watching, listening on the radio. Now remember, it's not the prayer that saves you. Those are words communicating with God. What saves you now is putting your faith and trust in the person of Jesus Christ and His finished work on the cross of Calvary. That's what's going to save you. For we're saved by grace through faith. Oh, praise God. Amen. And whosoever will may come. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So we're going to confess with our mouth. We're going to believe in our heart. We're going to call on the Lord, and we're going to receive him right now. So we want you to pray with us right now. Those of you in the auditorium, say pray with us as well. 
by where you're sitting right now. Pray this prayer with us. Dear God, that's right, go ahead. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord from heaven. I confess, God, I'm a sinner, and I've sinned against you, God. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me and to pardon me. And he will, my friend, he will. I do now believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross just for me, personally. I believe he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And right now, by faith now, I do call upon you, Lord Jesus, and receive you into my heart and life to be my Lord and my Savior, and to take me to heaven someday when I die. And I pray this little simple prayer in faith believing, in Jesus' name, amen and amen.